Hi everyone, uh, Patek here, and guess what? Today's video is my December wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I will be talking about all the books that I finished uh, last December. I just realized that although we are already two weeks into the month of January 2024, I still haven't talked about in more details about all the books that I finished in December 2023. So today I'll be talking about them all. I finished a total of, I think, uh, five novels two collection of short stories and also one, I guess, novelette or short story plus 11 volumes of manga. So yeah, I guess I was quite productive in the last month of December, which was a bit unexpected because usually I don't read a lot of books in the month of December, but not last year. And before I really start talking about all the books that I finished uh, last month, I just want to mention one thing first, uh, briefly. Some of you asked me how I was able, how I'm able to always remember all the details, plus the important points that I want to talk about in my reviews or in my videos. Obviously, it all depends on the book that I'm reading. If it's a book that I love, I think usually it is much easier for me to remember. But again, it depends on the book. But usually, I do take notes. And although you can definitely write some notes down regarding what you want to say on your, uh, on your phones, I still recommend you to write them down. I definitely got this luxury pen, a Bastion pen from Bastion. So I guess you can definitely say that this video is sponsored by Bastion, but my point stands. I think by really writing them down using your hands like this, somehow, for me anyway, they stick in my mind better. As I said though, I don't do this for every book, but there are certainly books where I'm in the middle of reading and I feel like I really need to write this done because I must remember to talk about them later in my reviews or in my videos. With that in mind, I've been using this pen from Bastion for a few weeks now because I just want to test it first. And this is, I think this one count as a luxury pen and I can definitely see the appeal. And if this sounds interesting to you, then make sure to check out the link in the description down below and use my code PLEO. Uh, 20 to get a 20% discount on all the stuff available on Bastion. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much to Bastion for sending me uh, this wonderful pen. But seriously, to those of you who ask me how I'm able to remember all the stuff that I want to talk about, well, this is one of the way. Write them down. Moving on, the first book that I finished last month in the month of December, it was Cytonic by Brandon Sanderson. This is the third and the penultimate installment in the Skyward, uh, in the Skyward Quartet. And I was so worried when I was going to read Cytonic because I heard so many mixed things about this book. And although it is probably because I keep on hearing uh, bad things about uh, Cytonic, I had very low expectations entering this one. And I ended up enjoying this uh, more than I thought I would. It is certainly the weakest book in the entire series so far. Skyward and also Starside are certainly much better compared to Cytonic because although this was engaging throughout the whole book, but also it felt almost pointless. Cytonic definitely felt like a filler installment. Remember that in Starside, we started seeing uh, Spencer. Instead of spending time with the crew of Skyward Flight, we get to see Spencer spending her time with a new set of characters. And that, I guess, kind of happened again in Cytonic, but Unlike Starside, the characters that she encountered in Cytonic are not as engaging in my opinion. And also, the amount of stuff and details that happened in Cytonic is just was not enough to warrant another novel on top of Skyward Flight, on top of the Skyward Flight omnibus. And that's really my issue with Cytonic. Cytonic is not a middle book in the Skyward series, but it contains all the a frustrating elements of a middle book syndrome. And yeah, I guess that's why also many people, including Brandon Sanderson himself, struggled with Cytonic. Yeah, Sanderson actually mentioned that this is one of the most difficult books that he has ever written because he cannot just seem to get things right uh, for it. And other than this one, I finished the final title in Skyward Flight, Evershore. And Evershore, the first title in Skyward Flight was told from the perspective of FM. And then the second title, Redon, was told from the perspective of Alanik. And finally, in Avishore, we get the story being told exclusively from the perspective of Jorgen or Jerkface. And surprisingly, Avishore is actually the best uh, story out of all the Skyward Flight plus Cytonic. So I think this is up there with Skyward. Many important things do happen from Jorgen's POV. It takes place immediately after what happened at the end of Redon. But at the same time, Evershore did develop the characters wonderfully, especially Jorgen. And 
FM. You know, I keep on mentioning this. I'm not a fan of FM characters development in Sunridge and also Redon. It really felt like FM has become a character that is there only to be shown that she is madly in love with her new uh, lover. That's it. It really felt super YA and not in a good way uh, for me. I think in Evershore, we finally get to see the side of FM that works wonderfully as a support system for Jorgen and many other characters. And it is wonderful to see that. And yeah, for those of you who keep asking me about this, Skyward Flight unfortunately is not possible to skip. I think it is very important to read. There are many important things that happen in Skyward Flight, even though I keep on saying that this makes the series longer than it should be and I stand by that. But important things in the series, especially regarding the world building and the characters' uh, development, do happen in Skyward Flight. So yeah, I think you really should read Skyward Flight Omnibus before you read uh, Defiant, the final book in the series, which I'm going to read uh, this month. So yeah, I end up giving Cytonic a 3 stars rating, and for Evershore, I gave it a 4 stars rating. The same rating that I gave to Skyward. I still think that my favorite in the Skyward Quartet is Starsight. Once I'm done with Defiant, I think it will be a while before I read another book by Brandon Sanderson. Well, it will, it will still happen within this year, but yeah, I will be taking a break because I did read a lot of Brandon Sanderson's books a lot uh, last year. And moving on after that, the third book that I finished uh, last month, it was uh, The God Is Not Willing by Steven Erickson. This is, unfortunately, it ended up becoming one of the biggest disappointment of the year for me. And I know this is a mega unpopular opinion. Malazan, Book of the Fallen, is one of my favorite series of all time. It is up there in probably my top five. My top five completed fantasy series of all time. And The God Is Not Willing is the first book in the Witness trilogy. It takes place 10 years after what happened in The, in the Crippled God, the final book in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. But I could not click with it. And I think it is really time for me to admit that everything past Malazan Book of the Fallen might not be for me. I have tried reading everything well, anything by Ian Asselman, uh, past the Return of the Crimson Guard, and it just did not click with me. Path to Ascendancy, I tried that. I tried A Dancer's Lament, and it did not work for me. I think Ian Asselman's writing is just not suitable to my reading taste. And then I also tried reading Karkan Astrology by Steven Erickson, Forge of Darkness, and then Fall of Light. I finished Forge of Darkness. I gave that one, I think, a 3 or 3.5 stars, which is very rare in Malazan world. And you know what? I DNF Fall of Light. I couldn't finish that. I think it was the idea that there is no third book inside and I will have to reread A Forge of Darkness and Fall of Light again. I think having that in my mind constantly when I was reading because it's, well, if you have read Malazan, it is not an easy read. I think having that thought in my mind when I was reading Fall of Light really affected my reading experience of it and I end up DNFing Fall of Light. I might end up trying that again though once A Walk in Shadows is out. But I truly expect I would love the hell out of The God Is Not Willing. The, the book currently has an average rating of 4 points 4.6 on Goodreads and most of them came of course from fans of Malazan Book of the Fallen but it just did not happen. I'm really sad about it, not gonna lie. I love the Malazan world. I love Malazan Book of the Fallen. I have done a second read of the first three books in the Book of the Fallen and I love them all even more. I think there's a good chance if I did a second read of House of Chains or maybe or maybe a full reread of the entire series, I think maybe there is a bit of a good chance that I will end up live, loving The God Is Not Willing more. But for now, I would just say that it disappointed me. I have done a full spoiler review of The God Is Not Willing on my Goodreads and also on my blog, Novel Notions. If you really want to know my full thoughts on it, you can check out that uh, written review. But yeah, I'm really sad to say that The God Is Not Willing is really not for me. The characters are not memorable and somehow the banter between the Malazan Marines felt a bit forced uh, to me. So yeah, I am in deep sorrow about it. And as I said, I don't know, maybe someday I will give a Karkhana trilogy and also the Witness trilogy a try again someday. And maybe when that day comes, maybe I will end up loving them. But for now, my heart remains solely with Malazan Book of the Fallen. Moving on to the next one. Thankfully, this was another great book from Tad Williams. This is The Heart of What Was Lost by Tad Williams. This book 
It's kind of like the like the epilogue to Memory Sorrow and Tonjuji, and also a prelude to The Last King of Boston Art, the sequel series to the Memory Sorrow and Tonjuji. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, I will be reading The Last King of Boston Art this year. I will start reading, I think, uh, The Witchwood Crown. Yeah, that's the title, uh, the first book in The Last King of Boston Art. I will start reading The Witchwood Crown uh, next month, in the month of February, probably in the middle of it. But yeah, I end up enjoying. Uh, the heart of what was lost. I know that it's only been a few months since I finished reading Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn Shuji, and I already missed uh, reading Tat Williams' writing style. I think he has a writing style that I really enjoy reading. It is beautiful, but also not too difficult. It is also quite accessible in my opinion, even though his books are considerably slow burn. Surprisingly, The Heart of What Was Lost, in about 200 pages long, is the most uh, action-packed installment. Most of the book is told from the perspective of Duke Isgrimner, one of the major characters in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn Trilogy, and also a new character, a new POV character from the perspective of the Norns, basically uh, the villains. And I really love the build-up and the confrontations between the two sides, between the humans and the Norns in the heart of what was lost. And the majority of the book is really about the build-up and also the details of the siege of Nakiga itself. The new POV characters from the human side, not Duke Isgrimner and not from the Norns, they took me some time to get used to, but after, after really understanding the intention of having them in this title, I end up appreciating the inclusion of their uh, perspective. Perspective. But most of all, as I said, I think this is a great epilogue and also it functions nicely as a great uh, prologue. An epilogue to Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn Trilogy and also a prelude uh, to The Last King of Boston Art. I strongly recommend this. And also just as a reminder, I do post a Spotify review of all the books that I read positive and negative on my Goodreads and also on my blog. So make sure to check them out if you want to know about my full thoughts regarding all the books that I talk about today and pretty much uh, everything really that I talk about in my wrap up in more details. And moving on to the next two, the next two titles I'll be talking about, both of them are a collection of short stories. And the first one is The Great Change and Other Lies by Joe Abercrombie. This book, this physical novella, is published by Subterranean Press and it is a limited edition. I think it is sold out now and I'm so thankful to one of my co-bloggers, TS for getting me this as a, a Christmas gift. But this actually arrived sooner than I thought and well, I end up reading this in a day. I love Joe Abercrombie's writing so much. The collection of short stories, four short stories, The Threat, uh, The Stone, The Point, and The Great Change are pretty much a detailed look into the behind the scene of what happened in the Age of Madness trilogy, the newest trilogy by Joe Abercrombie in the world of the first law. It is not a mandatory read, but for me, just to be reading another book, another story in the world of the first law by Joe Abercrombie is always a pleasure and a blessing. I just love his writings uh, very much. And of course, this ends up becoming one of my favorite collection of short stories in the year 2023, just slightly below Jet Yards by Fonda Lee. If any of you are fans of the first law and you want to read uh, The Great Change and Other Lies, it is still possible to read this one just in ebook format. I think it is available on Amazon and also on Subterranean Press. And and the book actually contains four interior illustrations by the same cover artist, John Anthony Di Giovanni, and they all look beautiful. And the other collection of short stories that I read uh, in December, it was Tales of the Sun Eater, Volume 2 by Christopher Rocchio. So I did say that uh, the first collection of short stories, I have a mixed feeling about it. And well, I guess you can say that. I still have a bit of a mixed feelings regarding the collection of short stories in the Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 2, but mostly positive rather than negative, like the one in Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 1. I actually remember I actually had a much better time reading the collection of short stories uh, this time. And I think that's a bit surprising because I did say in my a review of Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 1, it is most likely that my connection and also my absolute my absolute love with the Sun Eater series relies a lot on having the story being told from the perspective of Hadrian Marlowe. I think his first person perspective is just immaculate and also unforgettable. It is full of melodrama, but it is the kind of melodrama that I like to, I really like to read. And 
we did not get that a lot in Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 2. We only have, out of the six uh, short stories here, we only have one short story from the perspective of Hadrian, and it was a really short one. It is a philosophical one, I think the title is Knowledge, and I really like that, of course. But other than that, we finally get a short story told from the perspective of Valka Ondera. Yes, Valka. Valka is such an important character in the Sun Eater series, and to have a story being told from her perspective, it was incredible. And on top of that, remember that I have read The Lesser Devil uh, short novel by Christopher Rocchio, a short novel revolving around Crispin Marlowe. Well, there is a title here, the last title in the Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 2, and it is a continuation to The Lesser Devil. These three short stories alone was already enough for me to give a higher rating to Tales of the Sun Eater uh, Volume 2. And also, the first title in this collection actually gave hints on what happened to Hadrian in Kingdoms of Death. At the time of recording this video, I am about to finish reading Kingdoms of Death, and seriously, it is absolutely incredible. I will post my review of Kingdoms of Death uh, within next week, most likely. So at the end of the day, is this absolutely necessary to read uh, the collection of short stories and also the novellas, uh, the novella spin-off? For now, I will say not really, but will they enrich your experience? Yes, a bit. Especially some of the titles like Demons of Arai. But for me, I want to read everything out of the world of the Sun Eater. This is seriously on its way to becoming my favorite sci-fi series of all time. I cannot wait to talk about Kingdoms of Death uh, next week. So yeah, I enjoyed this one and I hope Tales of the Sun Eater Volume 3 will be even better. And I think I'm supposed to read that after I finish reading Ashes of Men. So that's it for the collection of short stories, but there is one more short story to talk about and this one is titled Long Chills and Case Do by Brandon Sanderson. This is a surprise a title from Brandon Sanderson to close the year of Sanderson. And am I a fan of this one? Well, unfortunately, I have to say no. But this is because this one is written, uh, I think, during uh, Sanderson's college years. So yeah, it is a long time ago. And I think we can put this in the same ranking as Defending Elysium. As Defending Elysium is a prequel title in the world of the Skyward, in the Saitoverse uh, series, and I am seriously not a fan of that. But in comparison, thankfully, this one somehow is better than Defending Elysium, in my opinion, even though it is still unpolished, it really show some features of Brandon Sanderson's storytelling, especially the one that we can see in The Frugal Wizard, the second secret project novel, and also in Mistborn, Wax and Wayne, the second era of Mistborn. So yeah, this one is really short. You can probably read this in under an hour, and it is a noir detective story. It is certainly engaging enough, even though I have plenty of issues, uh, with it, but you know what? This is a surprise novelette. I might as well just take this as a blessing and say well done to Brandon Sanderson for the year of Sanderson. And finally, the last novel that I finished last month, it was The Prophet of Eden by my friend and also fellow booktuber, uh, Philip Chase. This is the second book in the Eden trilogy, and for better or worse, I think The Prophet of Eden is a super heavy, action-packed, oriented novel. If you have finished reading The Way of Eden, a Philip Chase debut novel, and you prefer having more actions in it, and you want a novel filled with many uh, detailed action scenes, then this book is for you. I think Philip Chase has a beautiful writing style, and I really like reading his writing. But for me, personally speaking, I think I prefer his writing when it's about the contemplation, the philosophical, and also the character's building moments. Right from the beginning of The Prophet of Eden, with the arrival of a dragon and the destruction caused by it, well, I think you can definitely surmise that this will be an action-packed novel, and it is definitely super action-packed. The majority of The Prophet of Eden is really action scenes, and well, I have a bit of a mixed feelings regarding uh, this one. I still end up really liking The Prophet of Eden by the end because it is so rewarding. But at the same time, getting to that payoff was a bit difficult for me because this one is so filled with action scenes. The characters are constantly moving from skirmishes to small battles to big battles constantly. That is, it is practically non-stop. And sometimes the pacing felt off because of this, uh, in my opinion anyway. I know that this is probably an unpopular opinion because those who have read the first two books in the Eden trilogy do prefer The Prophet of Eden 
more than The Way of Eden. And although I really like the first two books in the Eden trilogy, I still love the first book more, The Way of Eden, which I consider to be the best fantasy debut being released in the year 2023. However, as I said, the payoff is amazing. I was a bit surprised and felt a bit odd that The Way of Eden did not feel like it contains uh, elements of Malazan Book of the Fallen, which is Philip Chase's favorite series, I think favorite fantasy series of all time, if I'm not mistaken. But this one, at the end, especially, definitely contained that. And yeah, the final battle, especially the chapter, The Prophet of Eden, was incredible. I love it very much. And one of the biggest surprises that The Prophet of Eden has for me is how much I grew to care about Orvadil and Gnorn. I think their relationship really reminded me a lot of Legolas and also Gimli from The Lord of the Rings. Orvandil is not similar to Legolas. Think of him as someone similar to Aragorn. The dual scene, if you have read this book, you will know what I'm talking about. The dual scene in the Prophet of Eden chapter was so well done. I love that one very much. And also, this is very different from a lot of uh, middle book of a trilogy in a fantasy series. If Philip Chase put this as the end of the series, it could actually work, even though it means that he will need to write a sequel series. And hey, that's happening anyway. But after reading The Prophet of Eden and also being proven wrong that Philip Chase is absolutely capable of writing great action sequences. I am excited to read The Return to Eden, the final book in the trilogy, The Return to Edan. It is kind of difficult for me to pronounce Edan because Edan in Indonesia means literally insane. So yeah, sometimes I end up pronouncing Edan as Eden here. But anyway, this was a good sequel and I look forward to reading The Return to Edan probably next in the next two or three months. I know that based on the receptions online, it really seems like the third book and the final book in the trilogy is the fan favorite. So that's all the novels and collection of short stories or short story that I read in uh, December 2023. After this video, I'll be talking about all the books that I start reading and also read in the year 2024. But I also managed to finish 11 volumes of manga, and that's uh, Attack on Titan by Hajime Isayama. This is another reread of Attack on Titan or Singeki no Kyojin, and it was from volume 11. Oh wait, it is not 11 volumes. I think it is 18 volumes. It, yeah, it was 18 volumes. This is from volume 11 until volume 28 or 29. Yeah, it is a lot of manga volumes, and I love my reread experience. I don't think I need to say uh, too much about this. I've been talking about Attack on Titan and Singeki no Kyojin a lot on my channel, even though this is not a manga channel. But yeah, I've been talking about it a lot and I cannot help it, okay? This is a big part of my life. A decade of my life revolves heavily around a Singeki no Kyojin. And yeah, it is not as insane as One Piece in terms of longevity and impact, but it is still one of the biggest impact that I have ever had from experiencing a story. And I love my reread experience of the series again. I still think that the anime overall is better than the manga uh, series though. Even though there are things that the manga did better, like it is more scary, terrifying, and the horror element in the manga felt more well done thanks to Hajime Isayama's artwork. But overall, I still prefer the anime. As for my book of the month, I did not have any 5 stars rating in December 2023, but well, this is my favorite book of the month, The Great Change and Analyzed by Joe Abercrombie. This is the only title that I gave a 4.5 out of 5 stars rating in the in December 2023. So that's all the books that I finished uh, last month. I know that, as I said, it is two weeks late because we are already two weeks into uh, January. But I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you who tunes in to find out the, the, my full thoughts regarding all the books that I finished uh, last month. But yeah. That's really it. Uh, do let me know what you think about the books that I finished uh, last month and also what was your favorite book that you read in the month of December. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye-bye. Lastly, I want to say thank you so much once again to all my patrons who keep on supporting me.